in the easiest of times, and this is not the easiest of times. Specifically, I'm an investment advisor with my own registered investment advisory firm. This designation means that I am a fiduciary for my clients. I am personally liable for the advice I give them, and I am unable to receive any compensation, kickbacks, or commissions from recommendations I make, which typically is something clients like because they can listen to me and I can tell them what they think. And similar to an attorney uh, or your CPA, these are not new designations for them. It is a new one in our, in our field. Uh, you can know that the advice that I'm giving my clients uh, is from the bottom of my heart, uh, the best in their interest. If you're not my client, then it doesn't apply. Uh, so beware that you can't, uh, you know, if you make decisions based upon what you hear on the show that don't work out, I'm sorry, um, not my fault. Not your fault. <laughs> okay. Well, gentlemen, our, our topic today, Bitcoin, uh, scam or a good investment. And uh, Mike, we're going to start off with you on this one and uh, have you explain to us what is a Bitcoin? Thanks for the opportunity, Tom. And this is no softball right here. Explaining what a Bitcoin is has been tried and not done effectively more than it has. So if you're truly interested in this, there's some really good resources on the internet to back it up. Uh, my favorite, honestly, is Wikipedia, uh, but I will do my best. Bitcoin is a store of value. It's called a digital currency. You can own it. You can sell it usually in dollars, but you can do it in lots of different currencies. You can own and buy it directly through where they connect you directly with a buyer and a seller, or you can use an exchange such as a Coinbase, and we'll talk more about these exchanges. And the idea is, is that this is a store of value called a digital currency, where it is not subject to any government regulation or other authority. It is completely autonomous, meaning that nobody's in charge of this thing which means that it is risky, of course. However, it works. It has started in 2008-ish. It was mainly started uh, under the cover of secrecy. There was a paper issued by someone that was referred to as Satoshi, oh, I can butcher this one up, Satoshi Nakamoto is the name affiliated with it. There has not been a single person that's come out and said, I am the creator of Bitcoin. We still don't know. Uh, it exists only digitally. Nobody can hold a Bitcoin. Nobody can give you a physical Bitcoin. Nobody can show you a physical Bitcoin. That said, you'll see a symbol a lot of times representing Bitcoin, and that will be a B with two, two lines through it, like a dollar sign, usually in gold. Uh, but don't be fooled. Uh, this is complicated. Uh, this is risky. And as an investment advisor, I want to be very clear that I typically... Well, I always don't advise people to buy this yet, because if there is a store of value that is outside of government and government influence and potentially tax influence, something that I should know about on behalf of my clients, I've studied it for years and years. Tom and I were talking about it on the radio uh, here in Bozeman starting in 2008. And I also want to add another caveat is that because it is semi-autonomous, meaning outside the law, there's a lot of illegal activity that happens with Bitcoin. And so if you have high morals, high moral opposition to drug trade, human trafficking, all sorts of things, uh, that actually kept me away from it for a long period of time. And it may keep you away of it, from it as well. You can imagine how if uh, drug cartels didn't have to work in dollar bills, they might be able to do more effective work. Now that said, this is academically fascinating. It seems to be going up. It seems to be sticking around. That's why we're here to talk about it. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, it's, uh, um, it, it's been a real phenomenon. And as you mentioned, uh, uh, it was very attractive to people who wanted to hide money. If people, you know, if people were contemplating a divorce and they didn't want the wife to get the big bucks, <laughs> they put it in Bitcoin. Uh, we just heard the other day about somebody who's got $200 million worth and can't remember their password. Uh, so they, they're sitting there saying, gee, hmm, I, uh, I, I'd really like to remember that password. And apparently they don't have a way for you to recover your password. So if you do. Yeah, uh, uh, the gentleman's name is Stephen Thomas. He's from San yeah. Francisco. 
Yeah. And he had a he 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 uh, had he put it on a thumb drive, and he can't remember the password for the thumb drive. And he he has ten attempts to uh, try. Uh, he's already used eight, so he's got two more attempts left. Yeah. And he has about seven thousand two seven thousand and two uh, uh, bitcoins on it uh, that he claims is worth two hundred twenty million dollars. But what's a what if it's a hoax? You know, I mean, he he claims he had other bitcoin, and he's still worth a lot of money. But yeah. A great story, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, the other thing, too, the Winklevoss twins, who originally came up with a Facebook idea that uh, Mark Zuckerberg stole from them, um, was uh, our big investors in Bitcoin. Uh, they've uh, done pretty well, I guess, with their uh, payoff from Zuckerberg. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, kind of an interesting deal. So. Well, the next question we've got to ask both of you guys, and I'll start with Mike on this one. Is it a safe investment, Mike? What do you think? Well, the easy one is no. Um, and knowing my regulation, my oversight, my disclaimer, uh, you know, the safest safest thing you can do is just put your money in CD or U.S. Treasuries and never take risk. So, no, this is not a safe investment. However, most investments that make a lot of money are not that safe. Uh, and so this is something that I would put in the basket of private investment in a company. I would put it in the basket of speculative betting on a pharmaceutical drug that will solve cancer. Uh, maybe even more so because there is no oversight. This is a communal oversight. This is a community driven valuation thing. However, 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 the mechanics that underline Bitcoin is called blockchain technology. And we're not going to tackle that one in this one because we would certainly fail. But it works. It is, in, it is right now permeating in various areas of our uh, digital world as a substitute for database problems. Uh, it's a new solution. It's a robust technology that's been proven and sound. And so the valuation, uh, excuse me, the tracking of a Bitcoin has been proven to be sound, meaning that this person that claims to have lost their Bitcoin, now they could be lying. However, the reality is, is that there are many Bitcoin keys, passwords that have been lost. And if they're not recovered, those Bitcoins can never be transacted. They are not able to be moved unless somebody moves them. There is no hack that uh, allegedly can occur. Um, and so the attractiveness is that twofold. One is the integrity of the system. Somebody can't take it from you. It is yours. Every Bitcoin that's ever been created can be tracked accurately and precisely on where it went and uh, and who has it. Also, more so, the finite amount of them. It is a decreasing logarithmic scale of how they're being issued. That means that there's a finite amount that everybody knows about of how many Bitcoins will exist. And this is really appealing to people that are upset with money manipulation through the Federal Reserve. This is something that is uh, is yet to play out on how it works, but think about, really, I want to make sure everybody only thinks about these things in terms of supply and demand. Is it a good investment? Well, for it to be a good investment means that the demand must be more than supply in the future. That is the only thing that you really care about. There's all these other things that are important to know so you can feel comfortable, so you have comfort when you weather out the storms. But if you know these three things, uh, one is what's the supply, what's the demand, and what's the integrity of it, you might feel confident getting into something like Bitcoin. Again, this is something that is speculative. People of normal net worths, meaning if you don't have a net worth over $3 million, no, this is like uh, gold is a much safer investment. Storing barrels of fuel in your in your basement, well, that's never a safe investment. But if you have more net worth, if you're to the point where you say, you know what, I have enough stocks, I have enough real estate, I don't need any more of those things. And we're seeing that happen as these, uh, as the K-shape recovery really does appreciate real estate and stocks. I've got clients that say, you know, what else is there? That's why I'm interested in this. I'm looking for opportunities out there. This is from a home gamer standpoint, caveat emptor out there. Uh, that said, we are seeing ways to invest in Bitcoin that don't involve having to own it yourself. As we, as Tom illustrated, owning it yourself has liabilities about keeping a password. 
It has liabilities about, well, how do I really transact this thing? You kind of got to be a pretty good computer nerd in order to figure it out. Wall Street has an answer for you. We have gone and created trusts that own Bitcoin, and then you can pool money and own a portion of this trust. It's something that we've been doing with commodities forever. We can do it for Bitcoin as well. The longest running trust is the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, ticker symbol BTC, excuse me, GBTC. I talk and I, Tom can probably parse that into uh, military speak for me. Um, but that is a convenient way that people can say, you know, I want to get away from the typical meat and potatoes of stocks. I have a small portion of this that I'm willing to risk on Bitcoin, but I don't really want to go to an exchange and I don't really want to own a thumb drive that I might lose a password to. How can I get in and get some exposure to it? Wall Street is providing solutions and that's one of them. All right. Uh, Shane, what do you think? Good investment or not? <laughs> Probably not, uh, but it's, it's a good marker that we always uh, search for, for uh, a reference of the market overall. Uh, I think, you know, it's one of these areas, sovereign funds are buying it in large amounts around the world. But let's put it in context. Very important. When we talk about companies, I always reference the capitalization of shares issued on a company like Microsoft, you know, 7.8 billion, you know, where uh, you have Tesla with 900 million. In the case of Bitcoin, it's 21 million. That's what was originally issued. It hasn't changed. And uh, the holders of, of the, of the uh, key to it uh, promise that they'll never increase it. And, and that's why you see the valuations and, and the fluctuations of, of the price. Um, the other ticker that uh, the company has is XPT. Because of the desire to, to get in the game, uh, they've uh, put uh, uh, created futures on the, uh, the Bitcoin itself. So if, you're, if you have some knowledge about uh, contracts, you, know, you can go check it out and you can see the, the opportunity to trade it by contract if you like. Uh, one of the interesting aspects of having markers like this is that in the long term, it gives you a scale of panic. Uh, meaning, you know, when people have uh, serious concerns coming or or, or pursuing, you know, ch money's chicken. It's and it want it wants to go to a safe place. So, uh, large valued players, billionaires, large valued companies, you know, multinationals, may find themselves in a need to move out of like you into uh, cryptocurrency just out of the sake of having it somewhere to create a, a valuation for what otherwise they'd get nothing for, for putting their money in a bank. All right. All right. Thanks guys. Well, uh, yeah, I, uh, my personal feeling I've, I've looked at it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I would think it might be, I, I would treat it much like, um, uh, gold as Mike talked about or something like that. Um, I would not put money into it that you can't afford to lose. Um, you know, just make it a, make it a fun thing. And, uh, you know, if it does something, you could add a little bit or add a little bit or whatever, but, uh, gosh, a year ago, it was like 6,000 today it's 31,000 per coin. Uh, so obviously you can't buy a coin, but, uh, Robin hood and some of these other, uh, investments that Mike knows about that you can get in, you can, uh, you can buy portions of Bitcoin. You can invest small amounts, um, uh, you know, you check and see what your what your particular group has uh, as their minimum. Uh, most of them are in the uh, I don't know anywhere from fifty or hundred bucks up to five or six hundred is the minimum. But you know, if you can if you can risk that much, then it might be worth uh, you know it might be worth checking out. I don't know. So, <laughs> well, the next question is uh, who owns Bitcoin? Are they like me? Are they uh, regular guys like the three of us that just uh, you know, we're thinking, Hey, uh, you know, should we, should we jump into this? So Mike, uh, I'll take you first on this one. What do you think? Well, I think as regular guys, I think that, uh, you know, one of us owns Bitcoin, uh, and that's me. <laughs> um, I chose to buy it. Um, not, you know, when I talk about investment things, I like to talk about, you know, direct a la carte or concierge level, right? Um, so direct would be, I'm, I'm not a computer nerd. I don't really know how to buy this stuff directly. I don't really uh, want to have a thumb drive that I have to, you know, I'm not worried about it at that level. Um, 
a lot of people are. Um, I use Coinbase as a custodian. It's a website that you can log in, set up your account. And uh, Bitcoin is not the only digital currency uh, out there. There's a myriad of them, just like uh, there's a myriad of flavors of ice cream, but chocolate seems to be the main one. Bitcoin's the main one here. Um, and when you look at the price of Bitcoin, you see it go up and down like bananas. So when I see things like that, I say, you know, I'm just going to apply the principle of dollar, cast, dollar cost averaging. Good investment uh, strategies work on risky things. And so I've got it automatically buying a small amount of Bitcoin for me every month. Uh, and I, it's automated. Sometimes I buy and it's high. Sometimes I buy and it's low. Um, and that's going to smooth out my cost. That's going to average it out. It's one tactic that I can use to say, you know, I'm not interested in going all in on this. Um, maybe there'll be some days that I'd want to get more active on it. But who owns it? Yeah, it is. It's all walks of life out there. We already covered that there's probably a fair bit of criminal activity out there. Um, but it's anybody that says, you know, I own enough stocks. I own enough bonds. Um, you know, personally, I'm less interested in going to precious metals. Uh, I think that the I think that's yesterday's version of digital currency. We're in a transition period, very new stage. I'm not going to say sell your gold and get into something like this. But ultimately, if you go to the future, I think, you know, I've yet to see a space show and I'm really enjoying the expanse right now on Amazon. I've yet to see a space show where people are lugging around any form of currency. Uh, nobody thinks that's going to be, be happening in the future. Uh, and I do think that, you know, the biggest risk to our economy is the confidence in the U.S. dollar. And there's very few ways to diversify away from that. This is just one of them. So people that are concerned, people that have extra wealth, people that are academically interested in it are in Bitcoin. Who's not in Bitcoin? Uh, the people that are concerned about retirement, the people that don't have uh, surplus wealth and the people that don't have the capacity to follow it. Uh, my day job is following money. This, is, this folds in nicely with what I'm doing. If your day job is working at a jewelry shop, gold is the place to be. If your day job is farming, I know clients that have some grain bins full of grain. I mean, do what works for you on this one. Uh, however, you will at some day be getting your hair cut You'll be hearing from your barber. They'll say, well, my Bitcoin's doing this. And you'll say, whoa, yeah. you know, so it's, it's pretty broad. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, the interesting aspect of Bitcoin in this discussion is there's a approximately 5.8 million unique users, which means less than four Bitcoins <clears throat> potentially per holder. So again, we're talking about a very narrow market that can be affected drastically. We've seen that and we haven't talked about the swings in price on it, but it can be directly affected um, be, because of that. The other thing that is so interesting about it is uh, that there's a issue about Bitcoin referencing mining. It, it, it's not hacking. They, they actually call it hash cash. And uh, uh, people will take, uh, you know, people of, of computer knowledge will take a group of servers and what they try to do is uh, they keep recording the transactions of a new uh, 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 processing power because when pre people purchase uh, the coins, they, they create what's called a, um, a, a new proof of work. And uh, it's a cryptographic hash that's sent out on the network. And th so these miners who are actually hash hash cash hackers uh, try to steal the uh, Bitcoin in the middle of the transaction from, you know, one person to another. It, it, it actually uh, um, there there are hash cashers out there that have acknowledged they've they've done this and uh, made money being able to steal the coins. So you have that issue and, and it's one we need to bring up. Well, some. Christ, somehow I put myself up twice and I can't get rid of me. There you um, go. Oh, that's good. Seeing you, in, 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 now I know I, my eyes are in trouble, right? Guys, because seeing you. It's like, for those virtual reality goggles that people use. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Now you put the, now you put the part of you up. The, the, can you talk. hear him? I can't hear him. No? Okay. Now you can. Now we can hear you. There you yeah. are. You're back. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to mute my other one. It's not working. All right. Well, 
Hang on, I'm gonna. I'm on a. Don't lead. go anywhere. We're fine. Let's keep going. Come on. I, I don't you see him as fine, Mike? Mike, I see him as fine. Don't you? I do. Yeah. Just keep going, Thomas. All right. I'm trying to come back in. <laughs> we'll see if there's only one of me. This now there isn't. All right, Christ. All right. Um. So the next question on Tom's list for you, Mike, is uh, will the IRS tax Bitcoin? Oh, this is this is the one, right? So uh, yeah. one of the things that's fascinating is that you can't find a Bitcoin. You can't find who owns a Bitcoin. We're all hidden. Um, and unless you use, if you go direct, uh, it's. I think it's impossible for somebody to find that transaction and pin it to you. Because Correct. I use Coinbase. I use a custodian. They are uh, legally obligated to operate in the country that they're domiciled, which I believe is Britain. Um, and so they're subject to those rules. And thanks to international treaties, uh, they also are now subject to some oversight by the U.S. And so if, let's say, I was audited by the IRS, and if they saw me put a significant amount of money over to this entity Coinbase, they'd say, hey, what's that? And if I didn't come forth and provide some documentation, they might say, you know, we think that you're trying to not pay taxes on any gains or transactions that you might be doing. Now, you pay taxes two ways primarily in this world, in our economy, on the income you make and on the profits that you make on buying and selling things, capital gains. Yeah, the, the, the other two ways are you declare it or you don't. <laughs> and so you can see the IRS, you know, they're very interested in collecting money that's due to them. And as a citizen of the UN, United States, I am obligated to uh, declare any capital gains that I make on buying and selling Bitcoin. I would then be liable for any subsequent taxes on that. And that is my responsibility as a citizen. Is there oversight to that regard? Is somebody going to tell me that is my the, on my uh, tax intake form? It doesn't say, do you own Bitcoin? Have you sold any Bitcoin? It does say, do you own any collectibles and have done any transactions in them? Because they want, you know, they're, they're fiduciaries also. Um, the, the IRS is wanting to, that's the gist. And there's a very delicate balance happening in the cryptocurrency world. That is, how long can they operate? How big can they grow? How much can they do before governments put their thumb on them? Uh, because they don't want that. They, they want to be autonomous. Uh, again, this is academically fascinating. Should they have oversight? Should there be a global currency? And if there is, who should get taxes from it? Uh, who, how is that accountable? Does, some, does anybody have the right to know where my money is and what I'm doing with it? In the US so far, yes. Uh, but as of now, uh, Coinbase custodians are required to submit information to the IRS uh, upon request, as I understand it. And me as an individual, I am obligated to, uh, you know, you sign the tax stuff that you give your CPA, you sign your W-2. That includes all the activity I've done. If I was not declaring Bitcoin transactions that I made money on, I would be committing tax fraud. That said, most transactions, I bet you, are not reported to the IRS and mostly they don't know about them. Yeah, and I, I just want to express a personal opinion. Um, you know, I really think that the cause of celebrity of, of uh, virtual currencies was the U.S. government's failure to deal with states that legalize marijuana. As we all know, it's still illegal federally. So uh, they used uh, the, that guideline to pre prevent people selling pot in Colorado and Washington. There were great stories about this four or five years ago. Um, and using banks, you know, FD, FDIC, um, literally some of them were bringing in so much cash, they had nothing to, they couldn't put it anywhere but in a safe. And then they found out about virtual currency and, and they, that's where they started putting it because they have nowhere else to put it. Uh, the success of it resulted in them making so much money that they then collectively started opening up their own savings and loans that don't require FDIC insurance so that they could put you know, deposit money on a, you know, business daily basis and, and keep normal records. Cause up until that it was pencil and paper and, and cash. So I, I just think that when, when you see government fail in its responsibility to help business, um, especially if business is, is, is trying to develop it. We hear this a lot from the U S government. Oh, states are great. You know, they're great, uh, 
labs for learning things and we can learn from what they they try but in some cases you know they just don't want to and i think this was one of those cases that created uh the establishment of virtual currencies there you go all right uh problem solved <laughs> i figured it out <laughs> anyway there's shane's call i bet <laughs> is that your call <laughs> Shane's going to be chatting with his uh, uh, with his uh, uh, heart specialist for a few minutes. So he'll return. <laughs> Hopefully, he'll give me a give me a sign when he's back. So, but anyway, let's keep going. Um, uh, who owns Bitcoin? And um, and uh, what about you know? You were saying that uh, it's pretty much out of sight. Uh, will the IRS tax Bitcoin? How can they find uh, that you have Bitcoin at all? This is why it's kind of attractive to the criminal element is that they can hide funds, hide profit, hide uh, a lot of things. So um, what's the IRS situation on this? Well, again, uh, as I said before, as citizens of the U.S., you're obligated to report all financial dealings that result in gains uh, with trading collectibles. It's up to the individual. Um, at the beginning, the custodians were completely autonomous, meaning the people that are helping somebody like me that's not a computer dork, they're actually my agent. They own it on my behalf, similar to a Morgan Stanley owning your stocks or a Schwab owning your stocks. That's what a custodian means. It means you've authorized them to be the ones that hold this. You know, I don't have any stock certificates for my clients. We use a custodian for that. Uh, it seems to work pretty well. Um, and so it's the custodian's responsibility at some level to make sure that they're not promoting nefarious work. That is the delicate balancing act that we're seeing play out. Um, and as of now, you know, if this thing goes big, if the, if the Bitcoin bugs are right, and this ends up being a, a true currency, because right now it's not a currency. I don't know what I could buy with a Bitcoin um, anywhere. I could, I, there's a pizza shop that's been there. I know I can buy some pizza. Um, and of course, this is all digital, so I can pay my 0. 0.0001 for a pizza. Um, I think you could buy a Lamborghini in Italy at one point. Um, but really, it's being used as a store of wealth. Uh, and so transactions, I haven't sold any. You know, My plan is just to say, you know, instead of gold over time, I'm going to own a little bit of this stuff, and I'm super fascinated by it. I don't have any clients in it. Um, but again, if you were to invest through public markets, through that grayscale Bitcoin trust that I mentioned, then it would be reported to the IRS same as any stock or bond position that you own. So you can legally invest and be on the up and up uh, just by going through your brokerage account. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think I read somewhere <clears throat> also there's some ETFs uh, uh, for Bitcoin or blockchains that you can get into as well uh etfs exchange traded funds there are you could buy a group of bitcoin companies i guess uh with an etf and um have those all at uh, all at one time so uh, shane's back with us i believe so so thank you anyway, I, I we're, you know, that's okay no not a problem I, I, that that was my heart specialist calling to tell <laughs> me about um you know by phone how how you know how well i may or may not be so Apparently, um, I'm good to go for another echocardiogram sometime in the late summer. Doesn't no. know when, but, you know, it, it'll take to get me in to see, uh, uh, you know, a doctor for an echocardiogram. So, wow. Yeah, that's how the, how, how uh, great is that's that? Canadian, that's that's, that's, medicine, that's a Canadian it? healthcare system yeah. uh, at, at work. So, well, uh, I was hoping you could make it to the end of the show, at least. But I'll uh, be okay. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I okay, seem to be good. good. Yeah, my face isn't puffy and I'm not all red. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about taxation of Bitcoin in Canada, Shane? Uh, any, uh, has anybody explored anything like that? Or well, of you course. I mean, it, it, the, you, you have to declare any income, foreign or, mm -hmm. or domestic, to you know the Canada Revenue Service. It's it. It's like any other foreign investment that you make. If you make money on a foreign investment, uh, most places don't have an obligation to report to Canada Revenue, but you do. And there, there's mm -hmm. there's no value in any amount of money, whether it's 50 grand or a billion dollars, 
not to pay taxes on in this world today because you, you, you know you just you're going to end up with a lot of personal hurt so no point yeah. in it yeah i i figure eventually the irs will figure out a way or <laughs> to, to force uh whoever whoever owns that account to fess up <laughs> how much you have i expect to see it on tax returns in the future probably mike wouldn't you think the irs needs money yeah um, they, <laughs> a lot of it too we're, yeah. we're kind of in debt they yeah. need a lot <laughs> um and they're understaffed they're underfunded they're understaffed and yeah. so for them it's just a risk reward thing um right now they're focused on trying to find the big perps out there um and so far the big, big perps are not not dealing in bitcoin transactions as far as i can tell they um, as far as i can tell well mm -hmm to see the u.s social security trust fund and the five uh, board members that uh, manage the oh five or 6.2 trillion dollars in u.s debt it, which is what the the uh, you know US social security holds you know they they say it's going to be bankrupt you know and by 2030 no it's got you know it's it's not going to be bankrupt but it'll have be they'll have to start selling u.s debt they've been holding because you know your u.s government I issued them special treasury bills and and took the money so now they're sitting right. with 6.8 trillion in in U.S. bonds. So uh, they should take a, you know, maybe a billion dollars or a hundred million dollars of that and buy Bitcoin. They probably make more money and fund the fund Social Security with it. I'm sure they're considering that as we speak. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, Mike, uh, will the government allow Bitcoin to continue unmolested? Are they going to, uh, uh, you know, when you look at $31,000 per coin, that gets, I would think that would get some attention. Yeah, I agree. And this is where the academic fascination really continues for me, too, because think about it. If they decided that, uh, that you weren't allowed to do it, they couldn't control that, mm -hmm. um, or it would be difficult to control that, right? The cat's sort of out of the bag. Yeah. And what would happen to the valuation of Bitcoin if they did? Uh, mm -hmm. So they are, they are uh, as befuddled as anybody. Um, what will happen in the future? I think that there will be probably some, some level of global treaty about global digital currencies that evolve uh, so that they can exist and not undermine uh, nation sovereignty. Sort of big thinking right there, but there'll probably be some international summit about this sort of thing. And, you know, let's be clear. It's usually not the first mouse that gets the cheese, uh, whether it was Napster versus um, Spotify or whether it was MySpace versus Facebook. Uh, there's a lot of people that think, you know, Bitcoin's not going to be the one this is just uh, uh, the first experiment. Um, so I think that they are interested. They're paying attention. They recognize that it has, um, that, it, that it's a difficult thing for them. It's outside of their control, except for maybe in a negative way. You know, the more they squeeze their fists, the more they slip through their fingers, that line from Princess Leia. Um, I think that might be what's causing them to, to pump the brakes on it. Again, right now they're focusing on the custodians keeping records of uh, my transactions so that they can request them um, should they need to. And that was their, that was the only step that I'm aware of that they've made since 2008 when it began. All right. Well, let's uh, moving right along. <laughs> the big question is, uh, I don't know if it'll happen in our lifetime, but uh, will some form of cryptocurrency eventually replace dollars and pennies and quarters and dimes and nickels and whatever? Um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think, Mike? You know, I think no. I think that uh, this is something that, you know, you can go from the people that are interested in this are, as I said, three categories, the academically fascinated, um, the very wealthy that just need to own a something different. Um, and the people that are looking to, you know, either do things, do things illegally or, you know, or, or want to be hidden uh, from view desperately. Um, and I think that there's value to um, not allowing that to happen in civilized society. So, yes, if you are a prepper and end of the worlder, uh, this may be of interest, although the Internet probably won't work in that scenario. So that maybe that won't work. Uh, the dollar works extremely well. Everybody likes it. Everybody uses it. And as we've talked on our radio show. You know, U.S. dominance 
in in the global economy uh, will probably change. It's never been all in one. Uh, nobody's had the ball forever in this regard, and we'll probably give up the ball at some point. Um, now, as that happens, there could be another player that's involved in things, but it's more likely that, as I alluded to in the other the other uh, the question, the sovereignty of these nations. Shane's an expert in foreign exchange trade. Uh, the dollar works really well right now. And the dollar seems to be the global standard, even if in the future the U.S. is not dominant. We'll still be talking dollars, I think, for a very long time. Okay. So my response to your question is uh, uh, governments are going to look at uh, avenues, as you pointed out, about virtual currency. Right now, the biggest player in the world isn't Bitcoin. It's Alipay. Um, Alipay was developed by Jack Ma, uh, Ma uh, $39 billion dollar a billionaire in China that disappeared in January. Uh, he appeared this week on a video uh, in a, a northern province. Uh, uh, he's a philanthropist about building schools in in western China. So he's he's shown up. Apparently, he's he's not dead, but he ran into problems with the Chinese government, and this is one of the reasons why um, he developed Alipay 12 years ago, and it's a, a third party mobile and online payment system and. The platform is being used principally in China to get rid of currency. There's no longer currency, as we've told everyone in China, other than in the countryside. 870 million people are using it uh, in China, and that's that was as of 2018. They believe it's now over 1 billion people in China are using Alipay on their phone system to make all payments and do all their banking online with their phone and no currency. So I think you'll see some type of mobile app, as, as in the case of this company. I uh, want to let everyone know that he had a $39 billion in initial public offering that was supposed to go off a month ago between Shanghai and Hong Kong. And President Xi and the fascist government in China pulled that because of Ant and Alipay. Ant, Ant is uh, uh, the largest uh, provider of financial advice in the world. Uh, you could take the 10 closest, the largest uh, financial groups, banks, whoever you want to, and, uh, you know, compare them to the ant group that he also created. Uh, he has uh, uh, th $34.5 billion in, uh, in, in, you know, uh, uh, the ant group was set, uh, excuse me, he's got $313 billion of Chinese uh, revenue and uh, over 500 million Chinese investing in the ant group in, in China. So this is a big guy. He's got 80 million, uh, 80 million merchants between the ant group and Alipay uh, to working to create this virtual banking. So th that's where it's going to go. And that's the answer to your question. It's not going to be virtual money. It'll be some type of app on your phone. Okay. Uh my my personal thought on this is, uh, you know, I seldom carry cash anymore. I almost never write a check anymore. Um, you know, I either have a debit card. I might keep 20 bucks in my wallet just for, you know, if something comes up that is too small to charge. <laughs> so, But um, I, I, I think somewhere along the line, whether it's, uh, as Shane suggests, with a phone or uh, whether it's cryptocurrency or something like that. Um, I know there are more and more uh, folks that are buying stuff or are able to buy stuff with Bitcoin. Um, you know, uh, merchants are starting to look at it. Um, I think Amazon will take Bitcoin. I'm not, uh, don't uh, quote me absolutely on that, but uh, I think they will. And the other thing that we talked about, uh, well, we just kind of touched on it, are uh, the blockchain technology. And I think that blockchain technology is going to eventually uh, be the, the way all this stuff is tracked because it's uh, some people think it's the greatest invention since the Internet. Um, and the way it works is just a database. Uh, Amazon is a database. They got all our products in a database. And, uh, but the way blockchains work is, uh, um, transactions are put into individual blocks and, uh, those blocks have a specific capacity. And when that block fills, it's chained to the next block and uh, so on. Uh, so every single transaction, 
of Bitcoin or anything else using blockchain technology is um, is uh, uh, you know is recorded forever. So, what do you think, Mike? <laughs> Explain I that think, frankly. I think users would be wise to disregard about the last five minutes of our podcast. Uh, <laughs> we've gotten in. Well, thanks, Mike. That was nice of you. <laughs> but look, I understand this is very complicated stuff. Um, we are not able to. I, I'm not able to understand blockchain. I've understood it once, and then it falls through my through my ears. Yeah. And then regarding um, things like like uh, Alipay and things like that, they are mm -hmm. forms of payment. Um, they are happening. They are denominated in the currency and backed by the currency. Um, and then there's frequent flyer miles programs. Um, and that's actually a pretty useful way to think about some things. Mm -hmm. But even in a frequent flyer mile program, you end up with one entity that controls the data and controls the valuation and exchange rate. And so there's problems that exist in all of these worlds. Yes, I'm paying for things by swiping this thing. Blip. I'm happy to use a credit card for it, but it would also work if I use another intermediary like Alipay, and then they would exchange. I'd have value there that would all be denominated in US dollars. Um, blockchain is, is uh, excuse me, Bitcoin is a step beyond all of that. Um, and that makes it really hard to understand and really hard for guys like us to actually uh, try and explain. Um, but that also is why it can trade independently. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot of people get excited by it. Yeah. Um, well, one of the reasons I bring blockchain up is users have rejected ETFs uh, for Bitcoin, but they have approved them for ETFs, uh, for blockchain ETFs. Uh, Canadian regulators have also approved the country's first blockchain, uh, that is Blockchain Technologies ETF, uh, HBLK, um, launched in 2018. And in the U.S., um, Realty Shares NASDAQ Next Gen Economy, BLCN ETF, and the Apply Transformal uh, Data Sharing, BLOK ETF, uh, they managed to collect two hundred forty million dollars in a week uh, for that uh, that investment. And uh, while blockchain is based on monetary system, like Bitcoin, is under review by different regulators across the globe. The underlying concept of blockchain has seen high adaptability and potential in the future. So that's uh, that's the only reason I bring it up. That it is uh, something. Um, you know, in its infancy, uh, uh, Mike and Shane, but, um, it may be the, it may be the thing of the future as to how we make transactions. I don't know if that's going to happen in any of our lifetimes, probably Mike's more than Shane or me. Um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So, <laughs> so that should wrap it up. Uh, Mike, any final words, uh, before we end here? Yeah, I think the takeaways are, uh, you know, and we walked through it, is that this is complicated. Uh, it clearly has success um, and it has merit and it's not going anywhere. Uh, but there's legal concerns, there's risk concerns. And, you know, that's risk reward for you right there. You don't make money by not taking risk. Um, if you were at all interested in this, do your own diligence. Please, uh, please disclaim me from any uh, role that I play in it. Um, but you know, we can't not talk about something that has had such a tremendous run up. And especially as, uh, you know, we're looking at, well, when are valuations going to come back? And as Shane always says, money's scared. Where will it go? Will it always go to U S treasuries when things get scared? Probably, but it might also go to some other places too. Okay. Shane, what do you think? I think it's a fascinating uh, experiment uh, with uh, finance and uh, with the sovereign debt of nations and the corporate debt of nations. People at some point are going to flee and there isn't enough gold to support, you know, that vast amount of money. So this may be, as I said, the only place they end up having is a, a your F room. There's over 700 different types of virtual coins that they could invest in to, to accomplish the same thing or start their own. So, I mean, it, it's something that uh, it needs to be watched. It's another marker for the, the market as I started this program saying, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, the valuation of Bitcoin is, is as much as a big as number to watch every day as the Dow. Yeah. Um, 
one of the ones that keeps track of all the various bitcoins is uh, coinmarketcap.com. We'll put that in the description down below. And also uh, we'll put some links to some of the um, uh, some of the things we were talking about as far as the investments uh, uh, in ETFs and things like that. So uh, we um, you know, we uh, as Mike says, uh, with any investment, you want to do your research. You want to consult a qualified person to help you if you know, uh, don't uh, get on swab and start buying stock <laughs> willy nilly, you know, uh, uh, do some, uh, you know, get some information. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we don't want anybody to fail. And, uh, another reason we bring this up is for small business owners. Uh, obviously small business owners like to invest, uh, some of their profits. So, um, you know, is this uh, a place you want to invest? Uh, as I was saying earlier, I think uh, don't risk more than you can afford to lose comfortably. Uh, as Mike, uh, you know, buys a little every now and then. I think that's a smart thing to uh, at least look at. See, see what happens to your investment over six months or a year. And uh, well, decide one, I just wanted to say that one of the original selling points of Bitcoin was for travelers. And what they suggested was, is you could buy the Bitcoin on your phone. And then when you travel to other countries, <clears throat> rather than get banged on uh, exchange prices on currency, particularly with credit cards. Oh, my God. You, you get slammed on credit cards. If you have a Canadian credit card and you go to the U.S. and, and use it, you know, the, you know, the credit card company slams you on the exchange rate. And, mm -hmm. and one of their big selling points was you can use bitcoins. So if you're a traveler, if you're a business traveler, a wealthy traveler, you know, a trust fund baby that travels, you know, you could use bitcoins because you can <clears throat> you can go to any country using your phone to purchase and it'll instantly do it in that nation's currency. It, it was an interesting selling point when they first started out. Yeah. Well, I think that's what's going to happen. I wouldn't be surprised if you have a Bitcoin debit card coming soon from somewhere. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's going to wrap it up for us. Uh, Mike, uh, any any parting thoughts uh, before you? Oh, uh, thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, you can find me online. McCormick Financial Advisors, Mike McCormick Bozeman. I'm always happy to visit. Thanks for tuning in. Let us know what you think. Yeah, we'll uh, put Mike's uh, contact info in the description uh, down below. And uh, before we go, uh, we've got to let you know a few things uh, that are going on. So uh, hang on. If you're new to our YouTube channel, be sure to hit the subscribe button below the video. Click the notification bell so you'll never miss another podcast. Like us and leave a comment. Tom and Shane are now on Patreon. You can become a supporter of the show for as little as $3 per month. Or if you go higher, there are some special perks only available to you. Your help keeps these small business podcasts coming. You'll find this Patreon link in the description below. Thanks for your support. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next small business podcast. All right, uh, that'll wrap it up for us. Uh, say goodbye, Shane. I will indeed be happy, be safe, live in the moment, and always live to work, come home happy to your family every day. That's the way they'd like to see you coming through the front door. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Shane, for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, we hope uh, you learned something about Bitcoin. And uh, we will uh, see everybody next Tuesday or uh, Saturday on the radio. So um, that's it for us. So thank you for watching. All views are welcome here. If you think it there, we'll say it here. We'll see everybody next week. <laughs>